Hi, everyone. Welcome today to the second webinar in NRCC's series, Lessons from the Field in a Time of Rapid Change and Crisis. So thank you for joining us today on this Thursday midday. Um, and today we'll be talking with Dr. Richard Reading, um, who I will introduce here in a moment. Um, for folks who weren't able to join in the last two weeks, my name is Ben Williamson and I am the executive director here at the Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative here in Jackson, Wyoming. Sunny and 85 degrees a day, starting to get dry, um, but still, still beautiful out. Um, I thought I would give a quick background uh, to the series to provide a little bit of background and some reasons and some goals for why we're doing this series. Um, I mentioned it last week, but I just thought I would reiterate. Um, so this is part two of our six part summer webinar series. Um, and the original intention came out of sort of conversations and looking back on NRCC's history of, of hosting dialogues like this and public conversations in times, in complex times and complex issues. Um, and we're certainly in one of those moments um, in history right now. Uh, and we've been, NRCC has been active in wildlife and natural resource management. Um, as well as community conservation projects for over 33 years now. Um, and so the goal for this series is to showcase the tools and real world experiences of people who are working kind of at the boundary, um, trying to innovate within the environmental field um, and working across those human and environmental boundaries. Um, and so like today, we'll be hosting our research associates and our resident experts, experts who are sort of working at that boundary um, and working to explain how they fit into the greater world around them. Um, so a few quick notes on logistics. Uh, this, this series will occur every Thursday from noon to one, um, and our last session will be September 24th. If you aren't able to make it to the live um, broadcast, they will be recorded and be made available on our website. Um, and then as I mentioned last session, the conversation will be structured around five questions I'll ask the question to our guests and then give them a chance to respond. And then at the end, we'll leave about 20 minutes for Q and A. Um, so if you have questions, you can go ahead and start to put them into the chat box and then we'll get to them at the very end. Um, great, I think that's it for logistics. So I'll just move into the introduction. So welcome today to Dr. Richard Reading. Um, we're so lucky to have you here today and we're really all looking forward to hearing what you have to uh, share with us. Um, a quick background on Rich. Um, Rich is currently the Director of Research and Conservation at the Butterfly Pavilion in Westminster, Colorado. He's also the Executive Director of the Coalition for International Conservation. Um, he has extensive experience in conservation. Um, he's worked on over six continents over 30 years. It seems like largely in grassland and arid ecosystems and often related to protected area issues. Um, and his current work is, is focused in Botswana, in Mongolia, Peru, Saudi Arabia, Kenya, Tanzania, and Nepal. Um, and Rich's work is truly community focused in that he works to integrate the cultures and values of local communities with the needs of wildlife and habitat. Um, Rich began working with the UN in Mongolia in 1994. And he's been working there since, primarily in, and, and Rich will talk much more about this, but in Iknart Nature Reserve on the northern edge of the Gobi Desert. Um, he's worked with butterflies, camels, kestrels. Um, he's also worked to develop management plans for the park um, that support local economies and communities. Um, and he also mentors and trains local ecologists. Uh, this year, which is an amazing accomplishment, Rich was uh, given the Order of the Polar Star, which is the highest honor Mongolia gives to foreign citizens. And it was for his contribution to wildlife conservation, his leadership, his cooperation, and his training of the next generation of Mongolian conservationists. Uh, Rich received his PhD from Yale University, where he is trained in both the social sciences and wildlife ecology. Um, his research then was focused on um, Indian blood, I think, around here in Wyoming. Um, and he worked closely with NRCC co-founder and Yale professor, Dr. Susan Clark. So Rich is currently zooming in from his home in Denver, Colorado today. He's got a lovely background of, of bison, love that. And so I'd like to welcome Rich today and it's a pleasure to have you with us today. So Rich, you can go ahead and unmute.
Are you able to unmute, Rich? No. How about now? <laughs> okay, great. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. Thanks for the warm welcome and um, kind words. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we'll just jump right into the five questions, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, sure. So to start off, to try to just like frame the conversation and get us started, um, and you can take this any way you want. Um, I encourage stories and reflection, um, but in your words, what do you do and why does that work matter to you? Yeah, what I do is I try to keep the same number of species on the planet that were here when I was born, um, still here when I die. Um, that's in a nutshell what I'm trying to do. Uh, I'm failing because uh, obviously species have gone extinct since, um, since I've been alive. And I think as a, as a group in conservation biology, we're not to be, not to put a, a dark cloud over the, the beginning of our conversation, we're failing um, our, our co-inhabitants of the planet. Really, we're not making the kind of progress we need to make. And so um, I think what I've been doing in, in my career is trying to, using the, the training I've gotten from Susan and, and others um, is try to bring an interdisciplinary model, a policy science approach to conservation, so a real interdisciplinary approach to um, developing methods and models for protecting species in protected areas. Um, I think that's the only way we're going to be successful personally. Uh, I, I think once you do the, the social um, and contextual analyses, um, decision-making assessments, you'll find that in reality, um, if you don't pursue an interdisciplinary approach to, to conservation, that you're really not addressing the root of the problem. And if you're not addressing the root of the problem, of course, you're not gonna make headway. Mm -hmm. What I do is, is, is that coupled with trying to um, bring up or, or um, impart what little I know to um, ecologists in, in the developing world, especially, but also in this country. And so what we really need to do, in, in my opinion, is to train people all over the world in interdisciplinary approaches to conservation, so at least we're sensitive to these um, to these broad range of, of, of approaches and these tools and methods that are there and have been there for a while, actually. Um, and so, um, by bringing up and 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 bringing forth these tools um, and giving them to uh, students in developing countries, we let them take what they know about the culture of their countries and infuse it with this policy sciences approach and these um, ecological approaches that we can give them training in. And they can come up with uh, real world solutions that fit their cultural context much better than I could do. So what I do is, is try to help them meld this, these, these kind of different approaches that the cultural side and the kind of ecological side and come up with you know, what hopefully will be more effective. So that's what I do in, an, in um, a, lo a longer winded way of saying it. But um, I think you know, we've had some successes in some of the stuff we're, do we're doing. Uh, a lot of that success goes to my colleagues overseas. Um, uh, I think that again, the training that, that, that they've gotten and their ability to meld that training with their knowledge of their culture has really enabled them to be really successful. Mm -hmm. And could you like just give us a few examples of places or species that you're working on? Yeah, I'm working on a wide variety of stuff, as you mentioned, from wild bacteria camels to Lake Titicaca frogs to to butterflies in Mongolia. Um, so it's it's really uh, I, I think what that tells you is that this method is transferable, readily transferable across taxa and across problems that exist in the world, and so. Um, Again, the reason I'm such a proponent of doing of doing this kind of approach is I think it is effective. I think it can be brought to bear on the problems that face so many species, even though a lot of the practitioners think that, and you hear it all the time, that, that the, the problems facing the particular species that they're working with is, are unique. In reality, a lot of the problems aren't so unique, or even if they are, by bringing a, a methodology to bear on the problem, they can come up with a, a, a much better, much more effective solution, much more way to approach conservation. So, um, so I work on a variety of things. You know, a lot of my work has been in Mongolia, um, as you mentioned, in Iknart, which is a protected area. Um, 
it's been <clears throat> much more effective than I would have thought possible. But when we got there, it was a paper park, which means it existed only on paper. Uh, nobody knew it was a park. It wasn't being managed as a park. And we took that and we developed a whole bunch of um, a, a whole bunch of initiatives. So what we did is we did ecological research because that's formed the basis of a lot of what we're doing. But we also worked with local people. So we did contextual analyses. So we worked with local people to understand what they wanted, what they what they saw with the problems facing conservation, whether they wanted conservation. And, um, and luckily in Mongolia, people are very much conservation oriented. So we had that as a, that's a very positive backstep. And then kind of the decision-making process, who was involved, who had the political power to make the decisions to affect change in ICNART. And then working with those, um, those governmental organizations in cooperation with the local, we were able to then develop a program, uh, a first developing a management plan, of course, um, but an area management plan that included both um, kind of outreach or education, if some people call it education, I call it more outreach, approaches to working with local people. Um, so very, it's been very effective and very impactful. Developing livelihood enhancement and empowering women. So one of the things that I've always um, harped on is that one of the best ways we can advance conservation all over the world is by empowering women. Um, men tend to be in the developing world where people are, are a lot poorer tend to be short-term rationality thinkers. So they're very much concerned about getting food on the table tomorrow, whereas the women are much more long-term rationale thinkers. And so they're thinking more about what kind of future are their children being raised in. So they're thinking about their children's education, the environment. So if we can empower women to make decisions, reproductive decisions, decisions for the environment, we can go a long way. So we empowered women. We set up um, women's cooperatives where we had livelihood enhancement. We set up ecotourism. We set up, uh, we, we set up a, a research station where we trained young ecologists and conservation biologists. We did this education outreach. We worked with local governments. Um, and we affected change at all these different levels through the, through the um, decision process, the, the social context of what we're doing, um, and the ecological parameters of the species that were in need. And the, the effects were, were, um, were better than I would expect. Um, would have expected. We really had a, a park that's been expanded by the local governments. So the local governments saw our data, saw that a lot of the wildlife was using areas outside the parks, saw that that was important and um, on their own created local protected areas that created the buffer zone around the, the federal protected area. Local people came to us and said, we want to help. We want to do stuff like clean up the park. We want to, um, we want to restore some of the mining that took place before it was a park. Um, can you help us do that? We said, sure. I mean, this, this came from them, not from us. And we were able to get grants so that the local people could do the restoration work themselves. Um, and of course, they wanted to do the grazing uh, as well. They wanted to increase grazing capacity because in these protected areas in Mongolia, grazing is, is allowed. So, um, so what we had then is a, a local populace that was very supportive. We had poaching that, that was stopped mostly because First, we started with, with volunteer uh, rangers, and then we started paying the rangers. But we also had this cadre of local people, because in Mongolia, they're nomadic, and they're basically strewn throughout the, the landscape, who could help us with law enforcement by telling us when there was poaching taking place, which is one of the big threats, poaching, mining, um, overgrazing. And now we're at the point where the, biggest, the last biggest threat to the protected area is overgrazing. We have um, working local people set up core areas within the protected area where they've agreed not to raise the livestock. So that's a great first step. We're um, now in the process of developing a, a grazing management system for the protected area so it's not overgrazed in the future. So um, by all measures that I can think of, it's been, it's been really successful. And in fact, the UN um, came in in, uh, I think it was 2010, and they looked at all the protected areas in Mongolia, well, not all of them, but most of them, and they ranked ICNARD as the best managed and made it part of a, um, a program that they had as a model protected area in their program. So it was another indicator that you know we had some success. But again, one of the one of the great indicators to me of success were the local people wanting to do some of the work on their own. Another indicator of success was other NGOs like TNC and WWF coming to us and saying that's Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund. Um, 
coming to us and saying, you know, we really want to thank you because a lot of the people that applied to work with us have been trained by your team down in, in Ignat. So we did what I think is important, which is, again, training that next generation of conservation biologists to do the conservation work. So this is kind of the way that we approach a lot of the projects we do, uh, where, wherein we're looking at livelihood enhancements, we're looking at mitigating some of the problems that take place, um, being really contextual in that it, really addressing the local people's concerns and working with them to come up with effective solutions to conservation problems and doing you know good solid conservation um, ecology work. So we've published over 200 papers on the work we've done in Ignart, which I think is, is another great accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was looking at the map of Mongolia as a country and how much protected area there exists in that country mm -hmm. is quite amazing. And so it seems like as you mentioned, like nomadic people moving in and out of the landscape, dealing and managing and working with those people on their own values and beliefs and attitudes seems like a, an important, if not the most essential part of the whole pro whole project, I guess. So, yeah. yeah. Mongolia has done a good job. I mean, when I got there, it was 3.5% of the country was protected. Mm. Um, the Minister of Nature and Environment, this guy, Botjargal, Dr. Botjargal, was in charge and really wanted to expand that protected area system. And, dramatically expanded it in just a few years, the first few years I was there, to 17%, now they're up at about 20%. And it's a government resolution that they want to protect 30% of their country. So um, if indeed they reach that, that level, they'll be one of, the, one of the premier countries in the world in terms of the percentage of area that's protected in their, in their land base. Wow. I give them a lot of credit. I mean, I give them a lot of kudos to the people in Mongolia. They've yeah. really, um, got a strong conservation focus on what they do. Mm -hmm. well, not everyone. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks for that. I think uh, we'll move on to question two here. Um, but that was a really helpful sort of grounding for the conversation. Um, so this this question and the next couple will be kind of a multi-part question. But the, the question, the first part of it is more uh, baseline is just I know this is probably a huge response from you, but how is your work being affected by the current pandemic? Um, and you can take that any way you want, but I think it's important to also go one step farther and um, think about all the different trends and crises that we're facing, whether that be governance, uh, all the environmental regulations that are being removed, um, the protests and actions around um, human dignity and rights after the killing of George Floyd, um, and so, yeah, the second part of that question is just how are you making sense of your work and your sort of your positionality within this current really complex moment? So you can take that however you'd like. Yeah, it's been a difficult time, um, obviously, for everyone. And um, in particular, I don't think I've ever, since I did some of my graduate work, I've ever traveled less. Um, I don't think I've ever been in this country as long as I've been for decades. Um, not being able to go overseas uh, and do some of the work that I've been doing. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, that's bad. On the other hand, it's what it's doing is teaching me other ways such as Zoom and other um, these kind of higher technology um, methods of, of kind of working with my colleagues overseas to keep the work going uh, to the extent we can. But in a lot of these countries, there's lockdowns and, they, and even my colleagues can't get into the field. Um, different there. They've been quite effective. They've had no deaths and only 30 some odd cases. So they, they can go to the field um, and they can do the work. So that's been, that's been heartening. Um, but I, you know, I, everything that's happening now beyond COVID is a big worry and concern to me because of the governance issues you mentioned and the fact that I see our government going the wrong way um, my, my wife is, works for Defenders of Wildlife and she does a lot of work basically suing the government and she's never been busier because they continually break the law, our own laws, uh, this administration anyway, um, with respect to the environment and weaken a lot of our protections for clean water, clean air, um, conservation, protected areas, you name it, they're all under attack. Uh, and it's interesting to me, um, you know, Black Life Matter, Matters, you know, the, the, the so context of what's happening. Um, I've, I've noted in the past that I've seen a kind of, while our biodiversity continues to decline, um, our, our social, social 
constructs um, or our um, social sensitivity seems to be increasing. So we get, don't, don't get me wrong, we've got a long way to go, but we're doing a better and better job of being more, um, except with the exception of this administration, we're being more um, cognizant of the fact that black lives do matter, that, um, that different lifestyles and different people um, should have the same rights as everyone else and haven't had it. Um, I think there's been a groundswell of support for that and it's growing over time and that's only good. So I see socially we're improving as a, as a species, whereas what we're doing to the environment is decreasing um, at, at the same time. But one thing that I think has happened is that because of these, these crises that have developed, that things like the biodiversity crisis and even to a certain extent climate change have been placed kind of on the back burner or kind of put off to the side. And, and so they don't get the same resonance with people as what is affecting their day, daily life. Um, and again, Black Lives do Matter. I'm a huge, strong proponent of the, the actions and activities that are, that are being um, undertaken to try to promote um, more equality um, in our society for all people. Um, and especially for um, for black people and other un underrepresented people like Native Americans, um, transgendered people, um, like everyone who basically has been persecuted in some way throughout, throughout our history. Um, but uh, I still see what's been happening then is things that the Trump administration is doing kind of fly under the radar. So you don't see some of the things that are happening to the environment, they're not making the news that they would make because, because of COVID and because of um, BLM are, are really impacting our ability to do a good job in conservation. So, you know, I'm rambling a little bit here, but bottom line is um, huge impacts. Uh, I really hope that we're gonna see a change in, in January after a, a monumental election in November, <laughs> um, because if we don't have that happen, I, I am, um, I'm going to be a little bit despondent in, ter in terms of my prospects for the future of this planet, mm. uh, as well as, to be honest, even the, even some of these social issues that are facing us. Mm -hmm. That resonates. Just having, sorry, you're breaking up. I can't you know, hear. Learned that the the pebble mine. Yeah. How about now? Now I can hear you. Okay. Just I was just mentioning. You know having read through the PS that just came out and uh, the lack of press and focus that it's uh, receiving is, is quite concerning knowing the implications for what, what can happen up there. Um, this is one example. So, yeah, just one example. Um, this next question, I think harkens back to what you started your conversation with. And I think it'll be quite interesting um, because I mean, you're, you're definitely an expert on sort of the interdisciplinary approach to the environmental work that we here at NRCC have long worked to promote. Um, as you know, the our founders and Clark really promotes this sort of um, looking at problems as both human and environmental problems. And that requires a level of self-awareness and contextuality in your work. I know that you work all over the world and many different cultures. Um, so I guess my first question is like, how could you expand a little bit more on, on, on how you work to seek to be interdisciplinary? And contextual in your work and then how has that made you more effective in your work? Yeah so I was lucky enough to um, to meet Susan in 1988 when I when I NRCFC was just getting started I think it was founded in 1987 and um, I've been working with Susan ever since um, at some level a lot more during my PhD she was my co-supervisor so of course um, with along with Steve Keller so uh, of course through my training with Susan and others, um, I, I learned this kind of policy sciences approach to, to conservation. And I think it's, it's served me quite well. Um, as I've mentioned, I think we've had some successes. Um, getting that, those successes to translate to broader audience has been difficult, although I find that more and more uh, people later in their careers especially come to realize the same kind of that the policy sciences teach us and the importance of those things. Um, so they come and they approach people like me or Susan or, or 
in the past Steve Kellett and say, you know, I want to learn more about this um, now that I've now that I've stumbled upon this this new this new methodology, which isn't new at all, of course, but new to them. So um, I've always been interdisciplinary, and I've published interdisciplinarily. Um, I've published in the social sciences. I've published in the ecological sciences, um, and because of that, I'm I'm kind of not an expert in anything. I, I know a little bit about everything, um, but what I do know is what I do try to do is try to keep self-aware, as you mentioned, about what I don't know, and and then I know who to turn to to bring in to who are experts in these other areas. And I think one of the keys is to find people who are open to working with other people in other disciplinary in other disciplines, and really being effective as part of an interdisciplinary team, so that they can bring that expertise that I don't have. I, I know enough to know what I don't know. Um, and yet the people that I bring in know a lot about a little bit. And so putting together interdisciplinary teams is a great way to go, I think. And so what I try to do is, is work that way. Um, what I've done in a couple places, like in Indonesia right now, we have, we just hired a, a person and in Mongolia, we've had a person for a long time who kind of works behind the scenes. And um, I don't always know what, what, what this guy does, Amulan Bader in, in Mongolia, but he but he's working behind the scenes all the time on a lot of the decision making process and cultural context um, to smooth things out and make things work. And he's incredibly effective. And same thing with the with the guy we just hired in Indonesia already. He's he's born fruit in being able to maneuver through the the bureaucracy that exists, which is a skill in and of itself, especially in some of these developing countries where the bureaucracies are enormous and very difficult to maneuver through. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of what it entails is finding the right people to help you do your work, I think. And that means finding a good social scientist, finding some good ecologists, finding some good um, decision-making people, finding some good policy people. And then finding, like I said, these kind of fixers, um, these people who know their culture quite well, who are able to move culture with fluidity and agility um, in a way that I could never do because I'm certainly just hasn't been raised in that culture. I don't know it as well. And as you mentioned, there's so many different cultures that, in which I work. Um, those people um, are invaluable. And um, they're kind of, um, I think Susan was referring to them as kind of internal advocates for what we do. They know how to find those internal advocates in the agencies and people who, who really want to do the right thing, but are thwarted by the bureaucracies. And then they can make things happen internally. So these fixers can find those people much more effectively and efficiently than I can. Um, and of course, there's other barriers like language barriers. I, I try to try to learn some of the, the culture and the languages, but you know, there's only so much I can learn. I can, I can learn some Mongolian, I can learn some Spanish, but um, that's about it. I don't know, certainly I, I don't speak any of the languages in Indonesia, which there are many. Um, I, don't, I don't speak Setswana, um, although I'm learning more. Um, I don't speak, which is the language of Botswana. Um, I don't speak a lot of the languages in, in the cultures I work in which I work. So that's important um, because so much of our language has a cultural sensitivity to it that we don't always recognize when we go into other countries. And so by forcing our colleagues to work in English, we lose something. We lose a great deal, I think. Um, and I think that's another good reason in and of itself to hire local people who know the language really well and hopefully can learn English quite well. Um, so one thing we do as well in a lot of the countries we work is we pay for English language lessons so that even though I can't learn all these other languages, it's really important in a lot of cases for people in the countries we're working to learn English because it is an international language. It's probably the most important international language and to learn it pretty well. It then helps us be more effective in that country as well. So we pay for a lot of English language lessons. Um, sometimes they learn it well enough, English well enough that they can come to school in the States. And that in some ways, or in England or someplace like that, in some ways that's, a, that's even a, a better kind of step forward because they learn more about our culture and then they can infuse that knowledge with their own culture. Mm -hmm. um, I might be getting off track here, but I, I think those are some of the mechanisms that I've employed to try to be contextual and interdisciplinary. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could, thinking about how different 
in in North America, how we manage our protected areas. I was wondering if you could speak to just a little bit on compare that to your work in Mongolia and protected areas there. And like, that's a very different paradigm around environmental management. And so it is. I'm curious yeah. Yeah, yeah, more about that. Yeah, Mongolia is, is in particular is quite different, but Botswana is different than again, and so is Indonesia um, and Peru. But in Mongolia, for example, they have a completely different paradigm. They have things called strictly protected areas, which came out of the Russian model. You, know, you have nature for nature. Um, and so people aren't allowed in, into those protected areas, not even for tourism, at least they're not in the core zones. So there are these core zones where you're not allowed to do any manipulative science, you can only do observational work. And you can't have any tourism. You can't have any kind of um, exploitation. You can't have any grazing. You can't have any mineral extraction. Um, and it really is nature for nature's sake. We like the closest thing we might have is the wilderness, but that's open to, to recreation as well and the damages that that can cause as well as grazing. They, they don't allow any of that. Um, and they don't allow hunting in any of the reserves in Mongolia. Um, that might change, but you know, when, when it was first brought up that they could open up some of the protected areas to hunting, like the nature reserves or the refuges, they said, that doesn't make any sense. You know, to them, it was anathema. You don't hunt animals in a protected area. They're protected, they should be protecting those animals. Um, they should be hunted outside of protected areas. And so culturally, it was just a different, complete mindset to what we have. Now, most of the protected areas, besides the strictly protected areas, do allow grazing, but don't allow other activities. So um, one of the biggest challenges to the protected area system in Mongolia in general, and I think it's a challenge to our country as well in a lot of our grazing management. And, um, you know, what I see in this country is we need a re reformation of our approach to grazing in public lands, just like Mongolians do. But they don't want private land ownership. So when the idea was brought forth by some um, range ecologists from the states that they should privatize land, there was huge massive protests across the country in, in Mongolia. They didn't want that. They, they want the freedom of movement as nomadic peoples to um, move to where the grass is good. Um, however, that's constrained somewhat because even though culturally they moved a lot as nomads, they were always constrained prior to the end of um, communism in, in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, because before communism, it was a very much a feudal system. So you could move as a nomad, but only within the realm of your feudal lord, or your noyan, as it was called. And now they can move anywhere. And that does have some, some implications that are, that are not so good for the rest of the country, because everyone can up and move hundreds of kilometers away, instead of just maybe tens of kilometers away. Um, so Mongolia's system of protected area is quite a bit different. Um, Quite, even though in some ways it's based on, on, a, on a US model, they've added on this component, this kind of Russian component of strictly protected areas. Mm -hmm. Botswana, they also have different kinds of protected areas. They have more protected areas that are set up um, as game reserves uh, mm -hmm. that are, some of them are, that, well, they, they ban hunting for a while, but it's, it's being brought back. Some are for the local people, mm -hmm. and um, they're for tourism and, and or hunting. Um, and what they do is they, it's in some ways a much more enlightened approach because they income that's generated, some of the income that's generated by the tourism or the hunting goes back to the local tribe that, that um, kind of historical ancestral um, kind of rights to that, that property. So it's a way to try to get money back in the hands of people, livelihood enhancement to kind of support conservation. Although, it's taking it in the shorts right now with the with the COVID thing because no one's traveling, and so it's really creating some hardships in countries like Botswana that were that had a good a, I think a pretty good model set up where where tourism was funneling money back to local communities, in a in a I, I want to say a mostly effective way because some of the some of the tribes there was corruption and some of the money was getting funneled off to as you might imagine could happen. Um, in, in some some bad ways, but for the most part, um, it, it engendered public support for the protected areas. And the only place that there wasn't public support was where there was a lot of uh, large carnivores leaving the protected areas and killing livestock. And um, we've since embarked on a number of different initiatives to try to work on mitigating that as well. 
and they're much more open to the mitigation efforts. Um, payment works really well in, in, in Botswana. It doesn't work as well in this country, um, but also working with them to try to um, identify problem animals and move them out of harm's way has been very effective. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm wondering, I know you did a lot of work in the GYE mm -hmm. back in the early days of the idea of ecosystem management. Um, so I'm wondering, like, now that you've worked in all these different places, is there any any different <clears throat> lenses that you see the GYE through now and, like, any sort of um, recommendations you'd have as far as <laughs> making all the different boundaries that exist in this landscape? I mean, there's many, there's so many agencies, there's private lands, we, we're living in this mosaic of, of lands, um, and which makes it hard to manage as a cohesive unit. So I'm just wondering, uh, yeah, if you have any ideas on, on that. It's incredibly complex, and there are similar kind of complexities. In fact, some of the protected areas, these um, international peace parks um, are even more complex. There's one that sits on the the boundaries of Angola, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Zambia, and Mozambique, and South Africa. And it's this massive um, landscape of different levels of protection, so different types of protected areas, or not protected areas, but government land, much like the GYE, but it's compounded, or com the complexity is compounded, I should say, by the fact that you have, what, eight different, seven or eight different countries involved. Wow really adds a, a, a level of complexity that you don't see as much in the GYE, but you might see a little bit more of in like Y to Y or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think in, in many ways, the GYE has helped inform me of some of the complexities that we need to consider or some of the things we need to consider when, when looking at some of these large landscape kind of conservation initiatives in other countries. Mm -hmm. It's more than I would say, um, it's brought lessons for me. I haven't really thought of it the other way, like what lessons have I learned overseas to bring back to the GUI, but I should. I think in some ways it would be helpful for places like the GUI to bring in people, and I've done this with at a smaller scale, try to bring in people from the developing world to the states to look at our problems and then come up with suggestions or ideas that might help us manage our systems. So I've done that on, on, smaller scale, on a smaller scale with say a protected area that we helped create in New Mexico, um, we are more a national wildlife refuge where we brought people down from the other countries we worked in and looked at what's going on there and brought in ideas and kind of cross fertilized um, by bringing people from, from Rio Mora overseas to Mongolia and bringing over some of the ideas that they had there as well. And that's enlightening. Uh, I think they, a lot of times some of the ideas that they have are um, in just, should be intuitive to us, but we don't see them. And yet somebody coming from the outside has, has better insight. And I'm trying to think of a, a great example of that. Um, but usually it has to do with how you, you involve the local people more effectively in management. So in um, Rio Mora, uh, we were able to work with the tribe and the federal government in a very effective way. Whereas in most of the refuges in the U.S., it's those kind of um, collaborations are fraught with conflicts. So I, the B National Bison Refuge up in Montana, for example, it's been nothing but conflictual um, and all kinds of problematic um, issues have resulted in, in trying to let the tribes help manage that refuge. Whereas down there, it's been much more effective. And I think our, um, our brothers and sisters from some Mongolia came much more open to the idea of, you know, giving the, the tribes more power not, rather than less power in making those decisions. Interesting. Yeah. It seems uh, very, quite distant and far from how we and think about co-management here in the States as far as with tribes that live on the boundary of national parks. Um, I think we got a long ways to go as far as that. Yeah, I think that the, you know, places like Mongolia, they, they just automatically do it. Same thing with Botswana, they automatically do it. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it, it, in some places in Botswana, it's effective. In some places, it's not effective at all. You know, I'm thinking of the, the San Bushmen, if you call them San or Bushmen. In Botswana, they like to be called Bushmen. In South Africa, they like to be called the San. Um, but that hasn't worked very well um, in the Central Kalahari Game Reserve and, and working with the, with the Bushmen there. But up north, it, with some of the, um, the Bushmen tribes in, in the north in Nogobango, it's worked very effectively. 
um, what's been different about those two different places has been largely a matter of the amount of human interference or um, influence in the system. So what, they, what, the, what the Bushmen want in the Central Kalahari is bore wells being drilled so they have water supplies. And they're not really opposed to doing so because that would lead to inevitably a, an increase in the population of Bushmen living in the protected area. And then the impacts of the Bushmen who are allowed to hunt the game on the wildlife there. Um, my own personal feeling is that they should be allowed to live there and inhabit the area, but probably not have artificial wells. If they want to live a traditional lifestyle, it's fine. Um, and, and maybe this is my own cultural perspective, but if they, if they want some of the amenities that modern society affords us, then there are, there are opportunities for them that have been made available to them outside of the protected area. So is that fair? I don't know, but you know, it, it, it's a tough one. Cultures change. Yeah, right. On that note, uh, the next question I have for you, and this is kind of a personal question, but just how have you evolved in your career as a professional since you started, and like, what's what are some of the big changes that you've you've uh, had over the over the years since yeah. you got your PhD? Yeah, I think one of the big, the biggest changes is just recognition of the incredible amount of um, insight. Um, brilliance and innovation that comes from outside of this country um, that can be brought to bear on conservation problems. And we all leave our PhD, including my colleagues overseas, raring to go and thinking we have all this, the answers where, where in after a few years, we find out pretty quickly that we don't actually at all have all the answers. In fact, we're gonna be learning for our, our entire lives. And what I learned really, really quickly is that, um, a lot of the answers come not from books and, and formal learning, but from people on the ground who live, um, who live their life with, the, with nature all the time and have insight that I wouldn't have considered. So again, having local fixers, having local people who, who know what they're doing or have lived in the landscape, training them um, in some of, the, some of the ways we know brings about a combination of the very best, I think, in approaches to conservation. So they have that local knowledge of culture coupled with that, that informed uh, education in, in ecology and, and in the policy sciences. And they can then forge really innovative solutions to the conservation problems that are facing them. And um, I, I see in, like in Mongolia that this worked by, for example, the, the local ranchers who or nomads who wanted to, who wanted to fix the, the mining their own, on their own. They saw it as their problem in, in their land. And basically, our colleagues kind of promoted that whole no notion and concept that, yes, this is your land. This is, it's, it's in a particular area, but it's your land. And it's your responsibility. And it's not going to fix itself. The government doesn't have the money to fix it. So if you want to fix it, and restore this habitat, then you're going to have to find out a way to do it. And they did it. You know, we helped them a little bit, but they did it on their own. And um, I think I would have probably approached it by going to the government and trying to push on the government, whereas they went and found um, an alternative route, which is them doing it themselves, which I never really considered that they would be willing to do, but they did. And um, and so, yeah. Uh, another good example is just livelihood enhancement options. Let them choose what livelihood enhancements they want. So the women's collectives in Mongolia were developed on their own. There's also women collectives we started in Peru um, <clears throat> that were formed by the, by the women themselves doing what they wanted to do. So we weren't telling them what to do. They were deciding what would sell by based on their knowledge of their local markets and their and their cultures. So most of the most of the visitors in both Mongolia and in Peru to these protected areas are local people, not people from outside of the, outside of um, the country. And so they know what's going to work, what's going to work better, and what's going to lead to a, a type of enhancements that's going to be sustainable for them in, in the future. So we can provide the seed, the seed money, so microloans in this case, which they did, they have paid back, and um, they can then do that through the work. 
we can also provide secondary markets. So a lot of these products actually are valued by people overseas. And so we can provide markets. Um, when I was at the zoo, we started marketing some of the materials that these women were making in the zoo store. And so the zoo would purchase these handicrafts from the local people, and then they'd get a secondary market, which would bring even more money to them. Um, that would require us to then also come back to them with ideas on um, kind of quality assurances and things like that. But again, the, the knowledge of what they want to do should, have come, should come from them because they know that local market better than we're ever gonna know it. So just a couple examples of how that local indigenous knowledge can be brought to bear and we can help them through micro loans or other processes through training um, or sometimes gifts, but mostly it's micro loans mm. um, and it's been effective. Interesting. Yeah. And then, so last question, um, and you can take this any way you want, but sort of what are three pieces of advice you have for the audience and for the world that could be, you know, strategies that you use, people that have influenced you, books you've read, just three general pieces of advice. Yeah, one is um, if, if you're passionate about something, don't give up on it, continue, you know, even if you have to do a, a zigzaggy line to get there, keep working your way towards your goal. Um, you know, my, my path to doing what I'm doing, which is what I always wanted to do, was not straightforward. I wouldn't say, but I got to do what I, what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I, I like to think I'm making a difference. Hopefully I am um, to a certain extent, um, but keep at it. Um, sometimes it, it might, the route might seem circuitous, that's okay. Um, as long as you're kind of heading in the general direction and you're willing to, to not get caught in, um, in, a, in a position or a situation that's, that's not gonna lead you to your ultimate goal. So in other words, you can get caught up in a, in a government job and there's all these incentives along the way to stay in government. But if you wanna do what I'm doing, then that's not gonna be the best way to, to get there. And so you might wanna leave that government job after you've had a few years of experience and pursue something else, even though it might mean giving up seniority or retirement benefits or things like that. So the first, the first thing I advise people is to stick with your dreams and your goals and, um, and try to make them happen. And, and they generally will, if you do, if you work hard enough and, and, you know, I'm not that bright, but I worked really hard, I think, and I got somewhere where I wanted to be. Another thing is, um, you know, promoting this, this, this policy sciences approach, approach, which entails, you know, standpoint clarification, knowing what you want, to do who you are, what you what your values are, how you see the world, um, really knowing your own biases includes social context, the people around you, um, uh, wh what's happening in the world surrounding the issue that you're that you're trying to address, be it a protected area or a species uh, recovery, and decision making process, of course, um, how a decision is made. So that policy sciences approach, I mean, I'm really condensing it down in a nutshell, is something to, to learn. And even if you want a, a, a straight ecology degree, I really encourage people to train either formally or informally outside of that to pick up this policy sciences approach to dealing with problems. It helps in everyday life as well. So these kinds of decision-making um, uh, approaches that the policy sciences help you with, help you with everything, every aspect of your life, not just your job, not just trying to recover endangered species or get a better protected area, but in, you know, what decision you make on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really helpful. And along with that is to be cognizant of the fact that most people aren't aware of the policy sciences and that's okay. Um, some people will come to it later in life and recognize that and help them when they, when they reach that epiphany, that moment of that aha moment, I think Susan calls it or whatever, where they say, Oh my God, this is so much more than, um, ecology, this is so much more than animals. Um, what, what can I do um, to learn more about the policy sciences or um, how, how did you approach these issues? Or they'll read a paper that, that Susan wrote or that I wrote and, and say, boy, this is so enlightening. And the paper might be 20 years old, right? Um, they just come to it late. And so be willing to help people um, if you already are steeped in the policy sciences help them along the way. Um, with that, uh, there are great resources out there. Susan, if you don't know what they are, Susan Clark, get some of her books. Um, they're great 
really, really good introductions to the policy sciences and um, probably what all most people need, actually, in terms of getting the information that they want. Um, and then um, the third would be that, um, you know, we live in a complex and um, we need to we need to not forget about the fact that, that we live in a biodiversity crisis, a time of biodiversity crisis. And we need to try to make that more apparent to more people. Um, and if we don't, we're gonna face a, a crisis that's worse than the climate crisis and, and worse than COVID and worse than BLM because it's gonna mean a collapse of our system, the, basic, the system that, that we live our lives based on, the whole, our planet, our planetary system is gonna collapse. We won't probably survive it. I think nature will, um, but uh, or maybe we will. We're, we're the kind of the ultimate weedy species, but uh, life will be very, very different. That's for sure. And so um, don't forget about the biodiversity crisis. We need, uh, as David John says, we need a groundswell of, of um, movement. Um, we need a, uh, not just people like me, but we need organizers, organizing people like they have with BLM to address and realize the importance of the, the biodiversity crisis and what it means for life on this planet. So, um, you know, it probably goes beyond my purview, but, but people have written about, about this in more detail um, than I can provide in this short little webinar in terms of what kinds of things we can do. Again, David Johns' book is a good one, is a good uh, name of it, but um, you could look up David Johns and um, uh, um, biodiversity crisis, and you'll and you'll it'll pop up on on Google for sure. So those are the three I'd I'd, uh, I'd throw out there. Yeah, thank you so much for those. Those all really resonate with me, especially having worked with Susan and learning the policy sciences and how much it's formed the foundation of this. How I see the world and see it, look at problems, and it's like it's such a helpful piece of a framework. So. Um, it's awesome. it's great to know to talk to you and to hear your perspective on on how that fits into your work. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you again, Rich. That was great um, sure. and provides a lot of fodder for me and I'm sure everyone on the in the audience here to think about our own work. So we don't have a ton of time, but I, I think we'll open it up to questions in the chat box for just uh, the next six to seven minutes. Um, Looking at some of them, some of them I hope I, I answered along the way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think this is a really good question from, from Maddie Jackson. She, she said, she asks, um, you know, for conservation, there is a barrier to getting into it. And often it's an economic barrier and an educational barrier. It's a, it's a difficult field to break into. So um, yeah, just like, do you have any advice or suggestions for, for future leaders who want to be a leader in conservation, but understand that there is a large barrier to getting there? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a, there was a barrier. I, I didn't have um, money from my parents for college. I, I put my way through through school. Mm -hmm. Had to work all kinds of odd jobs to support myself. So I, um, you know, what I, what I always tell people now is if they can do it, it's great if they can volunteer to get started and build a CV. I couldn't do that during my summers and, um, and even when I was in school and, and during breaks, I was always working to make money. Mm -hmm. um, try to support myself to get through school and through graduate school. Even in graduate school, I was working as a laborer on, on um, construction sites. Mm -hmm. So I was definitely not of the privilege. I was privileged. I have white privilege all the way through me, but I didn't have the kind of eco, um, economic a assets available to me that allowed me to build my CV. Um, so what I, what I did find is somebody like Susan who, and, and Steve Keller, who believed in me and an undergraduate professor who believed in me and willing to invest in me. And so um, you need to find those people and that's, that's tricky, but networking is key um, and showing your, um, your dedication and your competencies when you have the ability to do that is really important. So um, what I could do is show my competencies through school, which, you know, so I just worked my butt off to try to do as well as I could in school. And that would help me then get into other, other programs. And then uh, when the opportunity came to work with Susan on a project on, on Blackfoot Affairs and Prairie Dogs, I just tried to do the best I could so that she would become an advocate for me um, in a paid position, luckily. And um, 
you know, I left a, a better paying job with benefits to go do that, which is another example of, you know, maybe turning off a trajectory that wasn't exactly um, heading me in the direction I wanted to go to try to be more geared towards, towards the conservation. And then for people in developing countries, um, you know, I just try to support them any way I can. And a lot of times um, it's actually a lot cheaper. So in Mongolia, it, it only costs a few hundred dollars to go to school, but they don't have a few hundred dollars. But we can afford to put those people through school, even if it's not personal money, because it's only a few hundred dollars. So we can find people that are worth investing in. And at a, at a relatively low cost of investment, we can help them move forward and realize some of their dreams. And so I've been doing that uh, myself just personally since I do have a job um, and funneling money through my organizations to help as well. Um, so it's hard, but I think it's doable. Um, I think what we need to do more is get more diversity in the, in the conservation movement. That's one thing I didn't mention, but I, I feel really passionate about. I'm on the inclusivity committee at work. Um, I'm constantly trying to um, promote uh, diversity, empower women, and um, have, when I'm working in developing countries, have most of my students be from those countries so that I'm developing people of color to do the conservation work in their own countries, not having it be kind of conservation imperialism by people coming in and doing that work. Mm -hmm. If that, that answers that question fully, but there are barriers and, you know, we have to work to, we have to work to break them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means, I'll say that sometimes that means picking a lesser qualified individual who, who might be a person of color or a woman over um, someone who's maybe a little bit more qualified but might have had some, some privilege. Mm -hmm. Affected me, I can say, I know for, exact, for, for, for a fact that one job I applied for, I was told flat out that if I wasn't a white male, I probably would have gotten the job. <laughs> and I, I was okay with that. <laughs> totally. I think like looking back on all this, my, my two big takeaways are the local knowledge and indigenous knowledge is essential to these, these projects. And then the last is that we absolutely unquestionably need women in leadership roles like this. That's absolutely. Like, what we need. So, and people of color. People of color. So, so thank you so much for all that, Rich. Um, quite salient for the moment we're in. And I think offers us all a lot to think about, um, especially in the sort of intersection of biodiversity diversity crisis and social crisis and everything that's going on right now. So, um, yeah, I think at this point, we'll say thank you, Rich, uh, your day. That was really wonderful and insightful. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, well, um, I'm, and I'm, I was just going to say, I'm very, very happy to be here. And, uh, you know, I feel, you know, honored to have been asked to do it. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Absolutely. So I'll just make a quick announcement for our next uh, session. It'll be in two weeks on August 13th with um, Dr. Hannah Jakes from Future West in Bozeman, Montana. She has a really interesting background in environmental psychology and working with uh, livelihoods and on working landscapes in rural Montana. So I'm sure there'll be similarities with, with Rich's talk, but also in a, in a different uh, so I encourage everyone to to join for our next conversation on August 13th. Um, and so until then, I hope everyone has a safe and healthy several weeks here and we'll hopefully see you again on August 13th. And once again, thank you to Rich for, for joining us today. And so I will sign off now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.